I'll take the opportunity to welcome everybody uh, that is joining us through YouTube. It's great to have you with us as well. So that's it for my introductory notices. Um, let's move to today's session uh, with uh, John Quinton. Professor John Quinton will introduce our speaker for today. So it's it's a real pleasure to to welcome Alberto virtually to the Lancaster Environment Centre uh, to to give his talk. Um, Alberto's I think quite well known to to many of us in in the Environment Centre for his work mainly in hydrological sciences. He's worked particularly around uh, flood estimation, uh, uncertainty estimation, climate change, and and precipitation. Um, and I guess uh, so. So many of my colleagues in in the kind of water group in 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 Lec will will know him well. Uh, but to others of you, you may not know uh, Alberto quite so well. So I'll just give a, a brief potted history of his his career. He's he's an engineer by training. Um, uh, he uh, got his PhD, I think, back in 1996. I think in Parma. Is that right, Alberto? I was looking on your CV and then moved to Bologna for his postdoc and has been there ever since, I think, and is uh, is now professor of hydraulic works and hydrology at the University of Bologna. Uh, and, and not only is he doing the, the, the research I mentioned earlier, but he's also teaching courses in water resources management and advanced hydrology. Uh, and he's had a kind of a history of service, I guess, to the hydrological community. He's, uh, led taking leading roles in the International Association of Hydrological Sciences. He was division president for uh, hydrological sciences in the EGU for a while. He's he's served as editors on many hydrological journals and he's now currently president of the EGU. And it's really in that role that we're inviting him to give some perspectives uh, today. And he's going to be talking about the new mission of geosciences in the age of pandemics and beyond. So over to you, Alberto, and, and welcome. Thank you very much, John. I'm uh, very uh, flattered by your introduction. I'm uh, trying now to share my screen, and uh, I hope uh, you you can uh, you can see it. And just one second, I managed. Uh, I managed also to get the chat uh, visible for me so I can get uh, uh, just uh, give me one second. Yeah. Perfect. So again, thank you for the introduction. I must say I'm uh, very honored to speak uh, to you today. I have uh, always had a very high esteem of Lancaster University also I have, uh, I have had and I still have distinguished uh, colleagues and friends working there. I, I suspect they might be in the audience. So again, it's uh, a real pleasure. And uh, my talk today, it's not easy because uh, it's uh, something dealing with, uh, with uh, a societal problem rather than science. And it's something that, as you know, is new. Before I start, I would like to give uh, to give you a short uh, overview of uh, uh, my research activity, uh, my current and past research activity. I think it is important to convey the essence of uh, my uh, of my message today. I my research activity actually has been always focused on um, assessment and adaptation to hydrological change uh, and uh, including uh, climate change. Uh, land use change uh, and societal and economic change. So hydrological change in the widest sense. Currently, I'm focusing on multi-year drought frequency and adaptation. It's a topical problem in Italy. I am focusing on advanced monitoring techniques and in particular night light for assessing land use change. I am also dealing a little bit with climate change in terms of changes in rainfall and floods. Uh, and uh, finally, the topic that is very close to my heart, uh, which is, uh, I call it stochastic physically based modeling, but basically is uh, hydrological modeling with uncertainty estimation. And in particular, stochastic physically based modeling allows us to incorporate uh, 
knowledge uh, uh, about the physical processes into uh, statistical uh, analysis of hydrological variables. Uncertainty assessment is um, a classical topic in hydrology. I would say it's already classical, but still, uh, you know, uncertainty gets uh, an hard way to be accepted by some parts of the community. So this is another reason why the topic is very close to my heart. I would like to spend a few words on my institution, the University of Bologna. Again, I think it is useful to clarify the essence of the message and the impact of uh, COVID-19 on my teaching activities. Well, a few numbers just. Uh, we have uh, a total number of students, uh, which is about uh, 87,000, and almost 10% of them are international students. Uh, I think it's also relevant to say that we have a fairly good gender balance. Actually, we have almost 56% uh, of the students that are women. And also, I would like to say a few words uh, on uh, the European Geosciences Union, uh, EGU. As you mentioned, John, uh, I am currently the president. I started my term last year in April, and my term will continue up to April next year. Uh, EGU is uh, uh, probably the premier scientific association in Europe focusing on geosciences. Uh, we uh, organize, as you may know, have here a general assembly which uh, welcomes about uh, last year they were 17,000 of attendants. And this year we were forced uh, to organize a general assembly online. So this is something that I will discuss later. Now, COVID-19 was for me, as for you, as for everybody, a sudden change of context. I just would like to summarize the calendar of the crisis for me. On February 24th, schools and university closed in my region. My region is the Emilia-Romagna region. It was the second region in Italy in terms of affected people. Our situation was not as bad as in the Lombardia region, but still, as you will see, we had problems. We had the strong problems. Uh, on March 2nd, after one week of, um, of uh, closure, the University of Bologna went online with all courses in streaming. Uh, and we put online about 30,000 students in one week uh, with the uh, teams, actually. From uh, March 8th to May 4th, I was locked down. And uh, I, I must say that I never went during these weeks more than 200 meters away from my home. So Everything was done remotely uh, with, uh, you know, with the systems that the platforms that we know well, Teams, Zoom, etc. I had unfortunately some friends affected. Uh, one of them died. For about four weeks, uh, the intensive treatment uh, of the main hospital in uh, my uh, home city was close to saturation. So, indeed, uh, the situation was uh, was concerning. And on March 20, EGU decided to turn its annual General Assembly into an online meeting. The meeting was already prepared, so it was not an easy decision to put into practice. We decided to run union events in streaming by using Zoom, and the sessions were run online through chats. But we also opened a repository that was actually planned well in advance, this was something that we would uh, uh, materialize anyway. And the repository uh, hosted uh, the presentation and additional material, which could be commented. So there were two ways uh, to run the session through the chats and through the comments uh, of the repository. We had the General Assembly in the first week of May. May 4th, uh, we began the phase two in Italy. The lockdown was ended and some restrictions were kept. On May 15 and June 2nd, we released almost all the restrictions. The situation is now, is now fine, meaning that we didn't have a second increase of the infections. Of course, uh, we are taking... Uh, uh, we are adopting social distancing and all uh, the uh, precautionary action that you know very well. Now, uh, a few words about uh, the General Assembly online. This was a milestone because uh, I think it was the first large meeting that went online, uh, the first large scientific meeting. Uh, up to the 
closure of the submission deadline, we got 18,000 abstracts, more than 18,000, just a few more. And actually, we got 11,000, more than 11,000 presentation uploads, which means that more than half of the people, about 60%, actually participated to the online meeting. And these uploads received more than 6,000 comments. We had a number of more than 26,000 individual users over 721 live chats, uh, which received more than 200,000 messages. I think uh, the next point is interesting. We got attendance from uh, 140 different countries against a usual number of about 110. So it seems that diversity and inclusivity were improved by running the meeting uh, online and uh, of course uh, we know that this event is not replicable in the present form so we think that these numbers are amazing are really encouraging on the other end uh, you know everyone was locked in so we know that uh, it's not a model that can be replicated and uh, it's not given for sure that the enthusiasm that we got during this edition would be confirmed uh, in a second event organized in this way. Actually, uh, the geoscientific community uh, is much concerned by the situation. And uh, there are basic questions, uh, critical questions like, uh, how will our research workflow and career path will evolve in the future? And will uh, the, uh, our agenda uh, will need to be revised? And uh, should uh, also, will also, research funding be affected because of course uh, now society may identify different priorities and perhaps more important uh, what role should we play in order to contribute to recovering from COVID-19 and what advice we should give to early career researchers these are challenging questions I think if you look on the right of the screen the debate that followed the assignment of um, of the president of the European Research Council is a clear demonstration of the concerns that COVID-19 triggered. Now, we started with some basic premises. First of all, we decided to adopt a positive view. We thought it was our role. And so we thought that we can learn a lot from the current crisis. And we wanted to bring the message to the community that we can transform the crisis into an opportunity. I think it is our duty. If we succeed in setting the basis for a brighter future, this is the best way to honor the memory of the people who lost their life. But of course, uh, the key question is uh, how to do that, how to transform the crisis into an opportunity. We had the first uh, commitment. The first commitment was uh, uh, science must go on. For this reason, we didn't cancel the General Assembly at EGU, but uh, mm, we decided to make it online. And uh, uh, a second keyword that we, and in particular I, identified is synergetic recovery. What does it mean? It means that uh, as geoscientists, we have a precise mission now. Uh, while we recover from COVID-19, uh, we will need to introduce uh, profound uh, changes in our policies, in our economy. We have to make clear how these changes uh, may be useful also to mitigate the other global threats that are started by geosciences. So how can we recover from COVID-19 and minimize carbon emissions to mitigate climate change, for instance? How can we recover from COVID-19 by also taking the opportunity to minimize other natural hazards like floods, drought? How we can set the basis for a revision of our research agenda to make synergetic recovery a reality? Of course, uh, it's a challenging question and the uh, evolution of COVID-19 is highly uncertain. And I introduced this keyword, uh, which is another keyword of my talk, uncertainty. Will uh, we be able to adapt? So in order to uh, find a way to promote synergetic recovery, we, and in particular, I want to start from uh, um, recognizing a fact that was also highlighted by 
the recent interim report of the IPPR Environment Justice Commission. It's, it's online, I think you know it better than me. COVID-19 has increased the public trust in science. I think this is extremely interesting and emphasize the role, the relevant roles, role of the research community to seek the benefit of humanity. And uh, it opened a window of opportunity. And uh, we need a synergy to, of expertise to get to target. So we, I don't think we need to change our research goals, but of course, uh, we need to make a change. We need to change the way we work, uh, which may imply a slight revision of our agenda. And in particular, I think we need to revisit interaction, networking and communication to promote uh, the cooperation that is needed in order to go to move forward synergetic recovery. The essential premises, in my opinion, is again, we should be positive, but not only positive. Uh, we should, uh, during this process of revising how we work, uh, we should be inclusive and ethically irreprehensible, not just ethically correct, just we have to reach, uh, we have uh, to get close to perfection in terms of, of um, our ethical behavior. And let me say that I don't think that uh, harsh and rough tones uh, may help. Uh, uh, people today under the crisis appreciate open the optimism. This is also based on my experience uh, dealing with emergency in Italy. And uh, let me say in bold uh, that uh, we have to recognize uncertainty. COVID-19 is clearly showing uh, how uncertainty is relevant. Uh, is showing that not everything can be deterministically predicted. So let's uh, also take a new vision in geosciences with respect to that. Uncertainty will play a relevant role in uh, our future actions. Uh, our role is uh, to communicate, to find new knowledge and communicate new knowledge transparently by also recognizing uncertainty. And in order to be encouraging towards uh, cooperation, I also would like to say that I'm firmly convinced that uh, COVID-19 will also introduce a change in uh, the career development, the classical career path where one is stimulated to get publication and citation, I think will be revised. This is at least my hope in favor of new metrics that will evaluate public engagement, cooperation, and interdisciplinarity. Now, how should our work change? Because we need practical guidelines. Uh, and uh, I am convinced that uh, we should look, at least I'm doing that, we should look at the links uh, among geosciences uh, and uh, environmental health uh, and public health at large. They exist for sure. So as we pursue our individual research agenda, let's have a new look at the links with public health and environmental health. I think we should ask ourselves what we can do to make our specific research agenda, and I will make an example for myself at the end of my talk, how, how to make our specific research agenda helpful to humanity in the context of the current crisis. I am convinced that every one of us has an opportunity. And how should our work change? We have to look at networking with a different view and we need to eliminate barriers. We need to speak a single voice. This has been repeatedly said in the past and I wanna be clear, with a single voice, I don't mean that we have to, ha to elaborate a single opinion. A single voice means that uh, we should also recognize within this single voice our different opinion, our different interpretations uh, and uh, uncertainty. If we look at what happened under COVID-19, I think this is clear. Let's try to understand by looking at how medical scientists uh, uh, worked during the crisis, 
let's try to understand what was the key of their success, because I think they succeeded. During COVID-19, medical scientists did not reach a consensus, absolutely not. But their diversity of opinions was transparently communicated and discussed. And I think this was a key ingredient to get public trust, to get attention from the people. And uh, it is uh, this the reason of their success. The fact that they got public trust and they got attention of the people was indeed a measure of their success. And I think it was a key ingredient, the fact that they also communicated their different opinions their diversity. It was a key ingredient to get public trust. And I think we should try to include this ingredient also in geosciences. And let me say that probably also COVID-19 has shown that catastrophic predictions don't help to rise trust in science if they are not well substantiated. And I would say if they are not accompanied by a convincing uncertainty assessment. Let me uh, spend a minute talking about uh, virtual meetings and open teaching. Our experience in virtual meetings grew in the past two months in a way that we could never believe it was possible. And I think we discovered that uh, virtual meetings are a good opportunity. There is more interaction, diversity, inclusivity. Uh, there is a reduced environmental impact. Uh, uh, it's probably more transparent. Of course, there are there are counterindications. There are disadvantages. There is no face-to-face -face interaction. I'm not saying that we should go fully virtual. I'm just saying that, for instance, I am anticipating that EGU is adopting for the next meetings a blended model. The meetings will never go back to the previous configuration. We will try to merge the physical meeting with an online version because uh, we realize that this is uh, something that may change uh, our work uh, also in order to support the synergetic recovery. And uh, uh, let me say also that education is, is really within my heart, uh, is fundamental to recovery from COVID-19. And we realized that an essential ingredient to make education accessible is to make it open. And I would like to, to report on my experience. It's six years already that I uh, give to students my supporting material completely open. My website is open to the world and uh, the supporting material is given in the form of open web pages with links, etc. And my lectures are available on YouTube uh, for they have been available for six years already. And in these six years, I got more than 100,000 views, 10% from abroad. And I must say that during this period of emergency, the fact that I was equipped to give to students open material was for me a really winning situation. And I really want to say that I don't see anything against uh, making the lectures available to the whole world on the web. I just said yesterday in my university at, um, with the rector and uh, the department chair the same things, and uh, I think uh, I hardly survived. So I know that it's controversial, but on the other hand, I really think uh, this is the key for success in the future, open teaching. Uh, final uh, slide, uh, uh, and then I have uh, I go towards my conclusions again on public trust in science. Uh, again, I really want to stress that COVID-19 has taught a lot to me. Uh, we need to recognize that the geoscientific community has a credibility problem. We are no longer perceived as guardians uh, of objective truth, uh, including uncertainty, but. COVID-19 may present a way to resolve this problem if we succeed in changing the way we communicate. And again, how should we change by recognizing uncertainty and diversity of opinion? I would like to read this quote that you can see here from a recent paper published in Nature by Andrew Sphiron. 
With the great trust comes great responsibility. As we ramp up research to meet the public's need for solution, we must be especially careful to communicate transparent information about our capabilities, uncertainty, disagreement, or agreement. I fully agree. Just one minute to give a personal example, how I am trying to place my research goals into the context of synergetic recovery. Again, I think uh, COVID-19 has shown the relevant role of uncertainty for planning uh, in uh, the context of a crisis. So I think uh, this is an opportunity for also addressing hydrological modeling into a direction that includes with a different perspective uncertainty as an essential component and this is what i am introducing today but i will take the opportunity also to stress with my colleagues and i think we should learn something when we discussed uh, about deterministic rather than stochastic modeling. When we discuss about the role of uncertainty, we should learn something from COVID-19. Now, my conclusions are just the keywords of my talk that you can see here. And I just would like to conclude with two quotes. The first is by Winston Churchill, don't waste of good crisis. The second is by Ram Emanuel. He was chief of staff at White House uh, under Obama in 2009-10. You never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. Again, uh, I think this is the best way to conclude my talk. I really would like uh, to thank you very much for listening. And um, of course, I am open to your questions. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alberto. That, that was excellent. Um, so if people have got questions for Alberto, if they'd like to just post them in the chat, um, then then uh, Alberto will, will pick them up and do his best to answer them. But while we're waiting for, for people to type, Alberto, I was just wondering if you could say anything more about how the blended approach to the EGU might work and whether they whether people are already planning what that might look like yeah uh, i think uh, first of all there is one thing that i didn't say the blended mode is also adopted by the university of bologna in the next semester so in the next semester we hope to be able to go in, um, in physical present to teach but uh, we are managing, uh, we are really rushing uh, to get all the equipment to be ready as we go into the classroom to go also in streaming. And this is something that uh, we want to maintain into the future. Because again, we recognize the, that uh, the online part of the lectures is extremely important and helps uh, in uh, encouraging diversity, etc. Uh, now, EGU, uh, we are discussing about it. Uh, we discussed that we cannot go back to the previous model. And uh, even if the situation goes back to normal, as we, as we hope, and, uh, but in any case, we won't go back to the previous model. What we are thinking now is to issue the call for sessions uh, by uh, asking directly to conveners if they want to run uh, the presentation, the session in virtual mode or physical presence. If uh, they run in physical presence, uh, anyway, we will have uh, the opportunity to discuss online through a chat. So people will have uh, the opportunity to join online and asking questions uh, like now in the chat. If the session is run in virtual mode, it can be run remotely, but uh, there will be uh, a room available in the conference center for people who want to get together to attend the session. And uh, this is uh, still under definition, so I'm not able to give more details, but uh, we want to move forward towards a mixed and uh, blended, let's say, virtual physical meeting. So. Yeah, I sounds see. exciting.
Yeah, if I look at the chat, uh, I see a comment by um, Jeanette with Whitehacker. The online EGU meeting was fantastic. So what ideas are there for doing more online meeting in the future? I think I already partially answered. And uh, if uh, with the future, if you mean the full season, everything is uh, fully online and some meetings were cancelled, postponed. So what? The meetings that we run in the fall season, they will be only online. And as I said, for the future, we want to give uh, the two opportunities with no priority. And uh, we will see what's, what's going to happen. What, the, what is the percentage of people attending online, the percentage of people attending physically? What we perceived by surveying the community is precisely what you said. That was fantastic. On the other hand, uh, all of them, almost all of them said that they were missing something uh, about physical interaction. So I don't think we, we should go 100% in one direction or the opposite one. I think the mixed way is the best. So Andrew, <laughs> being late. <laughs> Hello, Andrew, very, very, I appreciate your attendance and uh, let me see. Uh, I wonder if you have some thoughts on what we will miss as we move away from traditional formats. Uh, I mean, I don't really think we will move away from the traditional format. I think, uh, mm, as I said, I really believe in the blended mode, which uh, uh, will mean that uh, on the one hand, you will miss some people in terms of physical interaction. Maybe. Let's see. But it is uh, probably likely that uh, the attendance will be a bit reduced. On the other end, uh, you, uh, we, we may benefit from a wider attendance online. Because, for instance, we have noticed uh, this year, as I mentioned, 30, I mean, 30 percent more countries. And they were countries from uh, mainly from uh, the African continent. So I think this is a great opportunity getting uh, uh, more people from these countries. Okay, so Keith, uh, very nice to, to, to meet you, to virtually meet you uh, here. And uh, I know your questions are, are uh, often tough, so let me read. The classical political view is that if the science is so uncertain, then we cannot believe it. It is clear that uh, in the epidemiological modeling, the uncertainties are epistemic in nature. I mean, um, I, am, I, I agree, uh, the uncertainties are epistemic, but uh, I, I mean, I think uh, the uncertainty under COVID-19 was huge and still now is huge. Still now in Italy, we don't know if uh, in the full season what will happen. And there are medical scientists that are completely divided but still, people can perceive what are their different opinion and make their choice. So, I mean, I think we should uh, we should try to reach the same goal. And uh, so, I think the politics in this case, uh, I know the answer could be easy, and I, I'll make it clear. But I think the politics in this case. Uh, is uh, actually listening and uh, it's making use of what uh, medical scientists say, even if they are split. Of course, as I said, the answer may be simple. Probably now they are forced to, to take their advice, the scientific advice, because uh, there are people dying. While in geosciences, uh, often, uh, you know, when uh, the uh, the event happens that kills people it's already too late for mitigating that event and when you start planning for the future it's a different situation but still i think we can learn something i, I really think that we in geosciences made something wrong in communication and uh, i mean I, I have my ideas and i think that precisely the fact that uh, we were not credible in uh, highlighting uncertainties was one of the reasons. But I mean, your question is very tough. I'm not sure I replied. I don't see other questions at the moment.
Okay, and let me see, Keith. And uh, uh, first, John, open teaching is a radical step. What means? Mm, I can, uh, John, I, I can tell you when I decided to put my uh, lectures online. First of all, I had to interact with the university because it was not clear. Still, it's not clear if a uh, university professor is allowed because uh, for for uh, administrative reasons. But at the end of the story, the university gave me the OK. And my colleagues told me, you will see nobody will attend your lectures anymore. Actually, I noticed an increase of the attendance of students because uh, what is uh, uh, I think what is the utility, the real plus of online lectures that uh, you have an opportunity to go back and see again the lecture if you missed something. You have an opportunity if you miss uh, some hours because you are busy for other reasons to go to the video and attend them. So it happens that the students when had uh, to make their selections of their uh, of their courses actually decided to take my course because it was offering the opportunity of the online lectures. And even now under COVID-19, we are moving towards the blended model, which means that the professor is not allowed to choose, but it is the university that chooses the details. Like they are telling us you have to make at least 60% of the hours in the classroom you cannot decide to go fully online. And uh, the reason why the university is uh, saying that is that they surveyed the students and actually 70% of the students said that they want to go there. Even if the lectures will be in streaming, they want to attend. And I tell you, those, most of those who said uh, that they would prefer to attend online are international students who cannot travel or are students that under the crisis have economic restrictions. So I don't really think that opening the teaching will, uh, uh, I, I think the opposite. I think it will stimulate the students to get closer to the university. And uh, Keith, uh, um, the climate community have to walk this tightrope, which has had the effect of constraining the climate uncertainty and beauty. Yes, I, 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 I mean, I fully agree, Keith. And my question is, maybe that they constrained the uncertainties too much. We constrained the, the uncertainties too much, and then we lost our credibility. Because, I mean, if you neglect uncertainty, you lose credibility. And uh, I understand your point that if you recognize uncertainty, you may lose credibility with respect to the politics. But I mean, I, I think, uh, as I said, uh, there is something that we need to change. And Jessica Davis, uh, can you expand more on your thought on how to move away from competition to collaboration? OK, first of all, I was inspired in this. Uh, by a talk that uh, was given at a union session at EGU Online by Jonathan Barber. And he said that we are used to compete as scientists, but under a crisis, uh, cooperation is, uh, is uh, better than competition. And I, I thought it was a nice, uh, a nice conclusion, and I reflected on that. Indeed, uh, during a crisis, uh, this is what we, we need. And uh, out in science, so let's forget about the crisis for a second. How can we encourage in science uh, cooperation rather than competition? I think uh, it is relatively easy, but I understand that it requires a radical change. We should adopt metrics uh, which uh, um, should recognize uh, cooperation not only number of publications and number of citations. I think uh, almost all of us agree that our current system for academic recruitment, which is basically international, has some limitations. And because it basically looks at metrics that don't give a comprehensive uh, assessment of the ability of the researcher. So I think 
the metrics will change anyway in the future and uh, we should uh, encourage uh, uh, metrics that recognize cooperation. I want to give an example. And uh, I was recently I attended another talk where a person I didn't 100% uh, agreed, but a person said that uh, to uh, recognize the balanced scientists in terms of gender, we could look at the gender balance of the co-authors of a paper. As I said, I don't fully agree because I don't think it is a useful indicator, but it gives a good example. So uh, in the metrics, uh, why don't we recognize uh, interdisciplinarity? It's, it's easy. My university is already doing that. Uh, it started one year ago. So look at the papers and classify interdisciplinary paper. Why don't we recognize uh, mentoring, cooperation with uh, certain countries. This is what I mean. I, I mean, I know it's not easy, but on the other hand, look at how many changes we were able to introduce in two months. I mean, in my university, uh, when we talked about uh, online teaching before blended model, it was impossible. We have been discussing this for five years and nobody wanted to take into in consideration the opportunity. And then in one week, it was amazing. In one week, two meetings, one week we went online. So, I mean, the crisis is indeed an opportunity. And let me say that if we transform the crisis in opportunity, it's not an opportunistic behavior, it's our duty. Okay, great. Any other, yes. any other question? And also, I forgot to say the presentation is on my website, but it, this is also recorded. So I, I, I think uh, also the presentation, I'm happy to, to share it with you. And if you have any other question, I really uh, would be pleased if you contacted me by email. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Alberto. John Quinton here again. Um, that, that was great and some really interesting and thought provoking answers to the questions as well. I'm sure we're all going to go away and, and, and give this a lot of thought. Um, I think all I've got to do now is pass it back to Ali, who will tell us something about up and coming uh, seminars. Hi, yes, thank you, John. Thank you very much, Alberta, for what was a very interesting presentation and what I found quite inspiring looking at changes that are, are already ongoing. Um, so all that's left to say really is thanking our audience for joining us. Um, like Alberta says, I'll be loading this onto YouTube as soon as possible. Um, uh, and our final session in this term's uh, online seminar series, which was new this term under under these circumstances. So yet another one of those opportunities that we've successfully taken, I hope. Um, our final seminar um, in the series will be on 24th of June um, with uh, one of our tropical researchers who works with ourselves and at Oxford University. So uh, that will be uh, taking us to another part of the globe um, uh, and an opportunity that we wouldn't normally necessarily have in person. So hope to see everyone again on the 24th of June and thank you very much. Thank you once again.